Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, I have a very special guest. His name is Howard De La Cruz Bancroft. And tonight we're going to talk about a subject that he has a long discussion on YouTube about. It's basically the vice or theory of everything, and he's going to explain his terminology. But uh, are you there, Howard? I am. Thanks. Uh, good to be with you. Thanks. Thanks for uh, joining us. I appreciate it. So before we get started about uh, the subject, if you could provide the audience with a, uh, a little bit about your background and how you became interested in this subject. Well, I was one of those kids that grew up always asking questions. So uh, my dad was in the military, and originally we were raised kind of like Roman Catholics, but without any of the statues or uh, the other paraphernalia that normally uh, accompany uh, Roman Catholic Church studying, so um, it was kind of interesting that we had a worship manual that had uh, the Catholic uh, order of services and songs, it had the Protestant, which is anybody who wasn't Catholic and not Jewish, and then the Jewish uh, order of services, and so growing up, uh, sitting in a pew uh, in a service, uh, your mind tends to wander when it's the same thing every week then over and over again, and so I would take that time to look through the armed services manual, worship manual, and uh, ask questions related to what the differences were um, between the three faiths. And uh, most of my questions uh, really didn't, I don't think that's uh, adequate answers for me. Um, I was also a kid who was very interested in science. Uh, I remember the, one of the first days I went to first grade, I was a four-year-old in a Department of Defense school in Japan. I checked out a book on the planets and the librarian said, you can't check that book out. And she, I asked her why. She said, because that's too advanced for you. So I just started reading to her. First, I started explaining to her what I knew about the planets. And I read the first couple of paragraphs. And she said, oh, you're good. You're good. Um, and so um, I actually have a really funny memory of one of my first days uh, in school uh, of getting a bunch of kids like me around a playground and uh, saying, hey guys, this is so much fun. I go, I go let's, now I want to tell you something really important. And I said, 20 years from now, we're going to want to remember this. And I got this look from them like I was from another planet. And I realized right away that there are things I think that I don't think my peers were thinking. And uh, I, I spent a lot of time trying to socially fit in and uh, trying to keep a lot of my thoughts in paper and questions for adults. And uh, I remember my mom eventually taking me to um, the Monsignor, which is one of the head guys at, at the church. And then eventually I got uh, an audience with the Archbishop. And I think it was about maybe 10 years old or something like that. And I asked him, uh, you know, hey, is there anything wrong with the Bible? And he goes, no, there's nothing wrong with the Bible. I go, is it okay to read the Bible? He goes, no, yeah, it's okay to read the Bible. Uh, I said, so if I read the Bible and I like it and there's things in it I want to follow, am I all right? He goes, yeah, yeah, you're fine. I go, what if I only want to follow the things in the Bible? And he knew where I was going with that because, you know, there's a lot of tradition. I'm not um, knocking anyone or belittling or being an iconoclast, but there are things in it that were added. In fact, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that tradition is one of their main tenets, the pillars of the church. What part of the country and, uh, was this in? Where you were you met say again? What part of the country oh, were you in? Sacramento at the time. Okay. My dad eventually retired in the Sacramento area. There were uh, McClellan Air Force bases nearby there. And and so the Archbishop turned to my mom and she says, uh, you know what? Uh, why don't you take this young man with you and uh, I can tell that you're going to have your hands full. And he never answered the question. So it was kind of like that my entire life. I was always asking questions of faith and science. Like, how did science relate to faith? And I would get the common answer that, well, you just have to believe, or you just have to have faith, or it's just a matter of faith. And in my opinion, I grew up believing that all truth was God's truth. And uh, if it was math, then it was God's math. Uh, if it was anything that was uh, reproducible in a controlled environment with measurable and predictable results, that was science. And so um, I ended up being involved later on, uh, making a decision um, to give my life 
to someone that I believe could give me the love that I needed to reach out to other people because I found out that I wasn't really able to connect with other people. That was kind of selfish. And I knew that that wasn't going to be the kind of lifestyle I wanted to be. That would be a lonely life. You know, it wouldn't matter how rich or famous you were, but if you couldn't connect and you didn't have love for someone else, um, then your life was meaningless. At least that's the conclusion I came to at, at about 16 years of age. So um, I decided to go, uh, I was going to be an attorney uh, studying law, but I saw this movie called Paper Chase. I don't know if you remember that from a long time. I think time. so. Was that Ryan O'Neill? Is that right? Uh, now what's, I'm not sure. What's was, Paper uh, Chase about? I can't remember. And, and uh, in the movie, uh, these guys really had to study. And uh, in public school, I really didn't have good study habits. So to make long story short, I, would, I, I did not think I'd be able to make, make the cut. Because I couldn't, I, I, school was easy, and so I never learned to study. I didn't have any study habits at all. Oh, right. So Paper I, Chase was about a first-year law student at Harvard, I remember. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so I ended up going to a community college uh, financially to try to knock out a bunch of humanities. Uh, unlike some of these kids who are $200,000 in debt when they get out of univer you know, university and they, they can't even pay for their student loans. So... Um, while I was there, I took a, a course called the Bible as Literature, and it was mainly just a secular understanding of the Bible. And I became intrigued with it because the Bible made a claim that said that, you know, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will not pass away. And I thought, wow, you know, that is quite the claim. And at the time, I decided to explore those elements of my faith. Um, so I ended up... Uh, going from the community college to uh, a Bible college. And I got my Bachelor's of Science in Theology uh, at Bethany. It's a Christian university out in the Santa Cruz, California area. Nice. And uh, then I went on uh, to, uh, I was going to go into the military. My dad had suggested going to the Army first, which I, I did not like the Army. And he wanted me to go to OCS, and I, which is Officer Candidate School. But I did not like it, made plans right away found out that there was a way that I could go to seminary. I could get commissioned as an Air Force. I want to go in the Air Force because that's how he uh, retired. And that was every branch of the, the military has a certain personality. And the Air Force has more of an office type um, environment than it does, you know, a slug it out, you know, shoot them up, bang, bang kind of uh, philosophy. And so I, I got uh, my commission. I got out of the Army. I became a second lieutenant in the Air Force, and I went to Austin Presbyterian Theological Center. And uh, there, my my science mind started to kick in. In fact, I in one class, I have to tell you, it was really interesting. Um, it was redaction criticism, and you've heard of that before. That's where you people say, well, what were the real words that Jesus said? Let's try to synthesize all the different gospel accounts and find out exactly what we think is in common. And I made this comment. I said, well, what if the, he actually did say these things in different times, in different places, and they're recorded by different people, but they're all true? Then we spent our entire time in this class not willing to consider any other options or any other presuppositions. And, you know, it seems like we didn't really learn what we were supposed to learn. Uh, we've missed out. And that the professor uh, who... He, he had graduated from the University of, I guess it's, I don't know if it's, it's called the Chicago Theological Seminary. It's a liberal seminary. Anyways, he was so angry, he took an eraser, he threw it at me, and he said, get out of here right now. And uh, so, you know, it's one of those things, remember I, I, I told you I would try to say things and they don't always go over real well. Um, so I ended up um, leaving there, and I went to Golden Gate a Baptist Theological Seminary in uh, near San Francisco for three years. It's now called Gateway Seminary, and they've actually moved their main campus down to Southern California. But anyways, to make a long story short, I was in the Air Force Chaplain Program. I had done a couple of tours, one at Holloman, which is in New Mexico, and one in Travis. And I was getting ready to graduate, and uh, uh, I had... Uh, a, an argument with my mother-in-law in the summer about problems that were happening in their family. There were some dysfunction. So, so they had this dysfunction going on in their family. And to make a long story short, um, I said some 
some things that I probably shouldn't have said to her. Uh, not not mean or nasty. I just said something about I don't know about you, but I wear the pants in my family, and she 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 just looked at me. She was yelling at me at the time. She stopped yelling. She goes, "We'll see about that." So I forgot all about that. I thought that I was the big man on campus, and I handled that with the witty saying and forgot all about it. Three, about three months later, they come out uh, for Thanksgiving and uh, said, "Well, we're going to take the kids and we're going to visit the grandparents of Oregon," and they never came back. Never came back. That was uh, the end of that marriage. It was the end of. Uh, I never really ever saw my kids like a normal father again because of the acrimonious uh, custody battle. The kids were abducted, but uh, her father and and her attorney uh, I, were able to make things uh, in such a way that it was so difficult that by the time I was able to see them, they had already convinced the kids that uh, that I didn't care, which wasn't true. So to make a long story short, that was the end of that career, and I was in IT, information technology. Um, I had just invented a microprocessor uh, for a micro for a cutting device, um, and it was really amazing. Um, and I couldn't even follow that through. We we created the device for about fifty dollars in parts, and we honestly could uh, sell it uh, reasonably for fifteen thousand dollars. And the reason why is because um, in these large manufacturing machines, they have engineering flaws, and they have these lucrative service contracts. Now, this was in 1986. They were charging $1,000 an hour to fix this machine. And this device fixed that engineering flaw so that instead of them having to two or three times a year uh, pay fifteen dollars to $30,000 to service this machine, this solved the problem. And uh, the guy who was actually running a, a company was the one who suggested what it should be priced at. And uh, he said, dude, you are on your way. You're a millionaire because they have these, I don't know if you've ever seen them, but the large newspapers and magazines, those big rolls of paper, Yes. those are the cutters that they use. And they ran 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And so you know that if they were able to charge $1,000 an hour, $15,000 to fix the problem wasn't a big deal. And so, um, anyways, make, a, uh, make that story uh, to finalize it. It was, I couldn't continue emotionally with my kids abducted and taken. Uh, it was very difficult for me to continue. So, um, I got into the IT world and uh, I had already been dabbling in it when I was in seminary back then. You probably remember this, but um, they didn't have uh, Windows interfaces and characters in Geek Greek and Hebrew. Um, you just had regular ASCII characters on the screen. Remember that? I had a K Pro 2 that had WordStar, and you had the program disk in A and the data disk in B. And I wrote uh, my first uh, involvement with computers, I wrote a program using uh, GW Basic that was able to use characters to convert um, those symbols. A time in my life where I just couldn't pursue anything else, uh, decided to. Uh, end up moving to New Mexico so I could be near my kids in hopes uh, that we'd have a normal relationship. Uh, but that didn't work, and I uh, ended up uh, teaching at a community college, teaching computers, by the way. Uh, I had been involved enough with computers at that point uh, where I was able to demonstrate proficiency, and I had proficiency based on uh, my business experience, which is real important at a community college. So. Um, I ended up uh, working at the college teaching four years. Then I got tagged by the state uh, when they took over a school district financially uh, to run their computer system. And I ran uh, Los Alamos, and everyone knows about Los Alamos because that's where they, um, of course, invented the uh, atomic bomb. Right, but Manhattan Project, yeah. Exactly. But in addition to that, they had uh, one of the most um, lucrative uh contracts with the Department of Energy to fund public schools. This was back in 1986. They had fiber to the desktop. Now, that, that was unheard of for any other school district in the country at the time. A one gigabit connection. Wow. And uh, so that was kind of fun, but I ended up uh, getting involved in politics, and uh, I decided to start my own company and doing consulting. And... Uh, uh, through a nonprofit, actually. And so then by then I was starting to get involved. I wrote a, um, uh, a Medicaid reimbursement program. So th what I'm saying is that I took this biblical background 
and the IP and my science interest, and I started to see how they combined and linked. And I started to do some uh, research for a book that I wanted to write um, based on carbon nanotubes using graphene. And uh, I actually explained this, and I mentioned that in the YouTube video, uh, that that research led me to some conclusions of how I could scientifically describe what I see as discrepancies and anomaly in the codes that make up everything. So that included both DNA, a lot of times we refer to it as junk DNA. Um, and, and so I have a theory now that is, makes everything that we now currently believe totally obsolete. So all of our current theories, whether it's the Big Bang or the super string theory, they all deal with time, space, and matter. <laughs> okay. And I actually think that that is after the fact, that the pre what precedes time, space, and matter is information, code, and word. Okay. And so that that is all, all the quarks, all the bosons, all the leptons, they have to know where to go, how to fit, how to interact. All of that is information. So at the center of all of that, uh, of all the functioning, we can see using math. Math gives us an explanation for how things work. But interesting enough, in the book and the way I describe it in the movie, these scientists were creating mathematical formulas and programs, computer programs, to um, figure out what would be the optimum growth environment for these carbon nanotubes. Because, you know, you grow them kind of like uh, crystal. Gotcha. And you can vary pressure and temperature and gases and electromagnetic fields and change the way that the um, the lattices for the for the nanotubes, the way they the way they look and the way they actually um, function. So when the scientists and uh, the way I describe it uh, looked at the actual real live analog um, carbon nanotubes that were um, that were grown in this environment, and they compared them to what they expected them to look like in the mathematical formulas and in the algorithms they use and the computer program, they noticed there's a discrepancy. And you know this too. When you use electron microscopy, don't you notice how strange everything looks? The smaller you get, how jagged it looks and how asymmetrical it looks. And so I, and I personally uh, ran into the same thing. So I talked uh, doing this research to some quantum physicists at Los Alamos Labs and Sandia Labs. And you know, they're, they're some premier labs in the country for some of the research they're doing. Sure. One of these guys is probably one of the top 10 quantum physicists in the world. And he said that those are just normal discrepancies. Those are normal variations. And I said, I, I don't see that. And in fact, in the, and I just told him in the movie, and you know this, I think it's within three nanometers now that they're running into the problem with Moore's law because the current transistors are so small that now the anomalies, the asymmetrical patterns on the substrata layers are starting to cause interference. In other words, they're bleeding over, the, the voltages are lost, and so now, now you can't maintain the values, the voltages you need for maintaining zeros or one values. And so instead of going horizontal, they're having to go vertical now. I don't know if you know that, but that's no, the, no, I wasn't aware. That's the latest thing in computer chip development. Oh, right, they're starting to layer them. Yes, yeah, so I'm familiar. With right, yeah. and so um, it, and when I talked to this quantum physicist, I explained to him. I said, "Look, uh, that isn't normal because um, it will change the electromagnetic characteristics of the carbon." So if the electricity is flowing in a certain pattern and it expects to be in a certain uh, design, it's either going to be a conductor or it's going to be a resistor. And it is no longer acceptable. Those variations must be accounted for. And so in the book, uh, I explain that I am able to extrapolate that and based on my findings in DNA and based upon my findings in noise and uh, the microwave background uh, emissions that we see, that it looks like all randomness, all chaos, all noise, all static, and all asymmetry appear to be signs of malware or a virus-like function in the pattern and the code that makes up everything. And so that changes 
that's a, that's a whole new paradigm because you'll notice now when we talk about time, space, and matter, they'll uh, talk about, oh, uh, the way the world functions, but they're dealing with um, something that's already been, and I, and I don't want to use this word the wrong way, but created means it happened. In other words, it, it evolved, it developed, whatever word, I don't care what word you use, it doesn't matter to me. The point is that what you see was made up of things that are not seen. It's that gotcha. information. So and you're so, saying that underneath all tangible, even scientifically ascertainable matter, there is a there's a program. Is that what you're saying? Right. Yes. Right. And the problem with the current simulation theory that's out there now is it does not account for a virus in the code. It appears to be that I am, and I keep looking every day, and, and William, if you can find somebody, let me know. But my, my information's all been copyrighted. It's all been protected by the Writers Guild of America West. This has been an o over a year that I did this. Mm -hmm. I appear to be the only person who can definitively offer that plausible theory that, that the simulation theory has a virus in it. So a lot of people believe that this functions like a computer, but they don't understand the randomness, noise, chaos, static disorder, asymmetry part of it. So you'll hear guys arguing for either symmetry or asymmetry, like the chaos effect is a, is a theory, the butterfly effect, right. and that is an emphasis on the virus, but it is not an emphasis on the, how they both link together. And then you hear a theory that people say that the virus created this, but the point is that the virus only exists to reproduce itself at the destruction of the host. It has no life in and of itself. It links to organisms, biological or otherwise, and then it can function. And so gotcha. I actually uh, call it a fake seed. It's like an artificial seed, the counterfeit seed. Seed has the actual um, uh, capabilities for creating life. Right. Just like even a seed of a man and an egg of a woman, when they connect together, then biological life begins to function and it begins to happen. Just like when you put the seed in the ground, it has the capabilities for growing, but in the right conditions, then the biological life begins to manifest itself. There doesn't appear to be anybody right now who is adequately using that kind of explanation. Gotcha. So you're saying that aside from the time-space matter analysis, there is an information and program, and also working within that is a virus. Correct. Gotcha. And, and I link that... Uh, much like uh, C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, I link that to um, uh, historically the biblical narrative. And the, what I say is, because remember my background, I have that uh, systematic theology working there. Um, I say that um, God, if it, and I use that term between you and I'm just going to say in a broad sense. Gotcha. The idea of a superior being, um, and you know how some people want to call him extraterrestrial or they want to call him something else. I don't care what they call him. The point is, whoever wrote this program, whoever put this program in place, um, it seems to match the biblical narrative that, in fact, that at one time this was programmed without the virus being active. And I speculate, and I say I have to speculate because when I don't know for sure, I can't explain it. I'm just going to say I'm speculating. But it appears to me that that matches the definition of the sin and the fall of man. So in, in my movie, the way I describe it, um, I set this uh, scene up, and I'll, I'll just replay it for what's you. The, what's the name of the movie? The Vertruvian Code Project. Gotcha. And that's just the working title for now. Gotcha. And the Vertruvian Code references. Well, the, Ver, Ver, the Vertruvian Man is da Vinci's drawing of what they call the golden ratio and mathematical uh, symmetry that was apparent uh, in nature. And I actually say that the man of virtue is the universal programmer. Gotcha. And in Hebrew, it's called insof metaknet, means infinite programmer. Funny story, uh, when I was looking for these names, I wanted to find old Hebrew names. I found Yoda, and I found a bunch of other things, and I guess that's where George Lucas was looking for information as well. Interesting. In old, old Hebrew terminology and old Hebrew word. So in the movie, I say that this this uh, being, he's called a messenger class being, uh, goes to the universal programmer, and he says, hey, I noticed the code that you use 
is different than the code that I use. You gave me this limited good goody two shoe code, and I see what you write with, what you use is uh, unlimited and it has good and evil in it. And I, I want that code. And the universal programmer tells him, you can't handle that code, to borrow a line from a few good men. Um, and he says, well, why not? And he says, because we're the programmers. And we program everything. It's a reflection of who we are. And we know good and evil, but it doesn't bother us. And so when we write a program or we create a program or we program a program, it, has the, it reflects who we are and has good and evil in it. And you are in the program. You have a beginning. And so it's like an if-then loop in a computer. If it matches the conditions, the statement becomes active. He says, the potential for evil, and I usually hold a set of keys up, and I say, the potential for evil, and I drop the keys. So, you know, here, here's a bottle, right? So this has potential energy in it. When I drop the bottle, it becomes kinetic. So when the, when the, uh, when the hat app, uh, when the, I call him Halel, uh, the messenger class being, when, when he accesses good and evil code, he corrupts him. Because now the evil that was potential became kinetic, and then it became active. It was a reflection of the programmers, and now it became active because it's easy in the program. And in the story, I make that parallel to kind of like Satan. He's like the great hacker, and the godhead is uh, universal programmers, and... Uh, the virus is sin, and then uh, Satan goes to Adam and Eve, the prototype people, and I make an inference to some biological interface that has to do with the plants. Um, and to make a long story short, they get corrupted, but everything in their program gets corrupted as well. So, for example, you've heard of Minecraft, right? Of course, yes. Well, you can create a map of Minecraft. They're called Minecraft maps. And that is the world that you're going to then have that character existing right and those that those characters exist according to the rules that you put in place for that map and I speculate and I say that that matches the biblical narrative where it says that God gave them this domain and everything and they under their authority so it stands to reason that if that that being became those class of beings the, the caretakers I call them the humans became corrupted then everything that they was under their authority became corrupted as well. And the, yes, I say that is why everything you see, every star, every quasar, every black hole, every object on Earth, every microscopic object, even even leptons and quarks, everything has the virus has affected it. Gotcha. So and, you relate to this virus as being associated with the fall of man. Yeah, and I think this is scientific evidence. I think that, um, and I tell young people this, because this message, I think, is catered for Generation Z kids more than anybody else, because they think in terms of computers, right. especially digital electronic devices. So if I frame that message in that uh, context, it makes more sense to them. Um, I'm finding that these kids, when you use words like God and Jesus and the Bible, they just they dismiss you. It's almost like they have a, a barrier around them that's been enacted by society and the structure of what they've learned. They've and never so grown up in an environment without electronics. Like, I actually yeah. remember not having, I mean, uh, you know, DVD. I remember VHS, Sony Walkmans. These guys never, they've always had a phone or something that is an interface between themselves and a reality. Right, and we know they're different because their choice of interface is, is electronic and digital. It's a computer. Because you see them in restaurants everywhere and places gathering, and they're not talking to each other. They're Snapchatting, Instagramming, and texting each other, and they're right there. So if, you, if they were to be given a choice, and I've asked, to, I've asked many of them, if they were to be given a choice to live full-time in a virtual reality world where they could do whatever they want, they, choo they would choose that world. They would literally be willing to be paralyzed and do nothing but exist to only function in that virtual reality world. There's never been a generation like that ever willing never, to do. No, that's amazing, yeah. And so, but that's caused a lot of problems because they've short-circuited the normal relationship process. And so they lack a lot of coping skills. They have a lot of emotional issues. They, they um, are the highest incidence of any 
uh, generation that we can measure statistically uh, to have the, the highest incidence of suicide, depression, and violence internal or external. I mean, a lot of those games, and I'm not being mean to anybody, but the first shooter games, they call them, um, aren't really helping develop a positive morality to thinking about caring for other people. Right. So I'm not knocking them, but I am only saying that they're not inputting positive morality in how to help other people. And so that's what I say the virus affects everything. I actually believe there's no amorality, not even in machines, that if you don't input morality into it, that it'll eventually, those machines would eventually destroy you. And, and Elon Musk and all these guys, uh, they say the same thing. I don't say they think. I don't think they say it for the same reason. In fact, I'm hoping someday I have conversations with these guys. Uh, but the point is, is if we were able to emulate artificial intelligence, and I describe it as three things: the ability to think for yourself, the ability to decide for yourself, and the ability to learn from your collective memory and experiences. If we could embed that in a computer and a and a robot, those robots would get rid of us as humans because we're inefficient, we're violent. We're selfish. I mean, when you look at the history of the human race, it's not a good history. Right. And 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 then the way that people look at the way we treat uh, maybe um, just our resources around us. I'm not I'm not a tree hugger by any sense, but at the same time, I I know it's I'm called to be a steward and to take care of things. And so I don't think putting toxic materials in the ground is a good thing. Um, I don't think uh, poisoning things is the way to go because ultimately it's counterproductive. Right. So with that in mind, I've developed a science-based morality. I think I'm the first person in history to, to offer it. And the reason why I'm the first person is because my science says that the coding has a, has a, uh, a mission. In other words, the code originally was designed so we could be fruitful and multiply. And we could have um, dominion. Okay, that those are the basic tenets of the code originally. Then, when the virus came in, that code got corrupted, and then there was death, and there was disease, there was destruction, War. there was selfishness. Yeah. Right, all of these things ended up happening. So, my science-based morality says anything that furthers and development develops the intention and purposes of the code originally is morally good. Anything that's counterproductive to the code is, uh, is morally bad. And so it puts morality in a different term, in a different, um, in a different uh, dimension, a different way of explaining it, context. And so people don't have to agree, they don't have to agree with me. I'm not asking them to agree with me. I'm asking them to just see that there's consistency in, in my thought and in my theory, that this theory covers every category of science all of philosophy, all of theology, it connects all the dots. I actually believe it's the first scientific base theory that gives you not only a consistent uh, worldview, but and explains the past, the present, and the future, but it also gives you the contents for filling in the dots for things that you don't know. And, it, and so if you have a consistent enough theory when you don't know something, you can go from point A to point C, and you can kind of fill in the dots. And as long as you're consistent, then you're you're probably on good ground. And ultimately, and here's what's so important: this has an application to your daily life. And what's so, that? Yeah. Well, uh, the purpose is to pursue selfless love. Uh, this this dimension was programmed by someone, or I believe programmers, who did it selflessly thinking about someone else um the theory the idea of the gospel is that he comes the universal programmer comes into the program to bring the antivirus so that we can pass through the last virus filter which is death so we don't get quarantined and separated so we can get to the next virus free dimension to restore that but he did it selflessly he gave of himself he thought of others i actually believe that that is the reason we are here we're here to learn about selfless love, how to care for others, how to, how to put them before ourselves. And in that pursuit, then we will look at things like the biblical narrative and see the value of it, not only scientifically, but also in the conduct and way we treat each other. So 
this is the first theory that is not only consistent, it's science-based, it's a worldview, but it also has a daily application to my life. So I'm driving down the highway, right? You, you've had this experience. You live in Southern California, brother. I don't know how you do it. <laughs> it takes these, a lot of patience. These people um, literally will be driving 95, 100 miles an hour, especially there's the road that goes from Victorville and it goes down into yes. that, yeah, San Bernardino. Yeah, yeah the it, goes through the, it goes through the mountains mm -hmm. and it is the scariest thing in the entire world. The entire traffic, four, three lanes or whatever it is, four in some places, that they're traveling. I've been 100 miles an hour, not trying to get run over. Yeah, oh. and, 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 you know, because it kind of goes downhill there once you get, and so they're... That's exactly they're, what you're talking about. And then all of a sudden, something will happen in the freeway. They get in the, I guess, that's a, I guess it's a San Fernando Valley when it starts to level out. Uh, I believe it's San Bernardino. Uh, San Fernando, yeah. no, I think it's San Bernardino. Yes, I think you're right. going into the Inland Empire. Right. Yeah. right, San Bernardino. And it gets to the flat area, and then all of a sudden, it starts to meet some on-ramps, and the traffic just grinds to a halt. Right. So now you just went from 100 miles an hour to like 5. And in your rear view mirror are guys still doing 80, 85, and they come right up on you and they'll change lanes at the last second. And you don't know, are they on their phones? You don't know if they're paying attention. It's the scariest thing uh, that I've ever encountered in my driving. And my point is, is initially that fear, and it is fear, um, if you've ever been in a crash. Now, most people, maybe they haven't and they're not afraid, but um, I've been hit by two red light runners. I was in a head-on collision. I've been run off the road. I mean, just things that happen to you. And so that my world's a little colored. I'm a little hypersensitive. I actually became a reserve sheriff deputy in my county for a while just so that I could call in bad drivers and get something to happen. If that, <laughs> if that makes sense. <laughs> it does. It makes perfect sense. I wish I could do that. My God. I'd be on the phone all day here in L.A. Holy smokes. Yeah, you know what? Ten it calls a awful. day. <clears throat> it is awful. It is awful. And so, to to try to concise or to to summarize that, um, that this theory tells me that there's a program for me, and that this is a an opportunity for me to trust the programmer, and that if he's going to protect me, he's going to protect me, and I need to feel I need to I need to take confidence and assurance in that in in that program, and then I need to care about this other person even though emotionally i don't at the time and that and and i'm the kind of person that i don't know if you know this but there's actually something they call the warrior gene that it's scientifically um been evidence that people react to fear differently people who are policemen people who are soldiers peace people who are firemen that they react to fear it 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 um energizes them and uh you know, the, they call it the fight or the flight syndrome. Right. It's where your amygdala is activated. So people with the warrior gene, they're energized and their um, uh, adrenaline kicks in and they're ready to fight. They're ready to go. They're on it, man. When you shoot, for example, if you shoot a weapon in a crowded room, most people are hiding and ducking. But there are going to be a few of those people in there that they're like, what the heck's going on? I'm going to I'm going to take this guy out. And so that's something unique in particular and it's great for those circumstances, but it's not so good when you're driving in a car. Right. Because you you literally want to go down and chase the guy and punch him and beat him up, but you couldn't of course you'd never get anywhere in LA. You'd be beating people up and getting arrested. Yeah, it would be Mad Max, so, Mad Max. Right, exactly. So this theory says you trust the programmer and you act in selfless love to care for that person more than you care for yourself. And that's that you cannot do in your own power. And that's where um, this theory says you must rely on the universal program to give you what you need in that moment. And so many times, in fact, it happens all day. It even happened this morning going to see someone. Um, I had to uh, ask, and you can call it prayer if you want. I had to ask to love that other person that I really wanted to beat up. I wanted to punch them out. If I had a chance, that's how I, I was feeling at the moment. But when I ask for that, that is what I think I'm programmed, the optimum program to run. It does change me because remember I talked about thinking, deciding, and then learning. 
once you decide that you want to love someone and then you start to think about that may actually be possible, then you can actually learn to do it. But it isn't just positive thinking, if that makes sense. It is relying on the fact that you believe that this world is programmed, that there is an optimum program for you, and that you need to operate in that program, and you're willing to operate in that program, and do something that your emotions tell you not to do. And that is counterintuitive. And so it's a message, and it, and it matches the biblical narrative, but it puts it in a scientific terms, if that makes sense. No, it does, definitely. I'm doing it for these kids as well, and I, pra I have to practice it myself. So I think that's what's so different about this. I don't think there's ever been anyone to do that and explain it that way. I've never heard of it. And you title it the acronym VICE, right? Virus in the Code of Everything? Right. Yeah, gotcha. So, yeah, because... Vice is a bad thing, and <laughs> right, no, it's perfect. It works. It's an acronym that works. <laughs> so that's what this is all about, and trying to get this message out. And uh, you know, we're real excited. Um, it's starting to gain momentum. Your being on your show is part of the momentum. Being on our uh, the largest radio station in our state recently. Oh, nice. um, I just connected with a guy who um, is a Hollywood producer and a director. And he wants to, um, he's actually been reviewing the YouTube. He just, I just talked with him yesterday about it. Um, people who are another uh, guy's actually from your part of the town. He lives out here. He produces uh, radio shows here. Um, I was on one of the radio shows and he said to me, which I appreciate, he said, I know that this message is going someplace because it's true. And he goes, I'm going to do everything I can to help get this message out. And so yeah. I kind of feel like a surfer that I'm just going to ride the wave. And uh, I do feel like I was tr programmed, if you want to call that, for a reason. And that is because of my systematic theology, this theory has to not only be scientific, but it has to be theologically accurate. Because I think even the biblical narrative, there is a lot of evidence that it has symmetry in it, patterns in it. Some people call it codes. Right. But I think they can they can misunderstand the purpose. The purpose isn't this is not a Gnostic interpretation. It's not it's not something that favors the intelligent intelligence. It says the purpose is to act in selfless love, to think of others before yourself. And that's the emphasis of this. And and if you think about it, even a mentally retarded person who has a very low intelligence an IQ has a great capacity to, to love. I have been around some Down syndrome people that just being in their presence brings such peace and such warmth and such comfort um, that that is an indication to me that the playing field is leveled by making that the goal, not intelligence. Interesting. And so I'm not, I'm trying to use intelligence to connect with people who would reject the traditional understanding, but at the same time, that is not the emphasis, if that makes sense. Oh, it does, definitely. So you believe that selfless love is the highest ideal, transcends, you know, the quest for knowledge or intelligence or whatever. Which right, other and, it's, and it's not just loving like, uh, and, and you know, we, you know about Greek, so you know about there's Eros, you know. Right, Eros, is, Logos. There's Leo, which is friendly, yeah. neighborly love. There's, uh, you know, um, also Estorgo, and there's Agape, which is the highest. I think that terminology means selfless is different way to think of it because it's talking about putting the needs of someone else before yourself. Gotcha. That that we can all grasp. If you just say the word love, that's so ethereal nowadays. It could mean anything. It's used in so many different contexts as well. You know, it's. Uh... Even the New Agers used love, or the Hindus, and all kinds of things. So it's used in different environments, I would say. Right. So putting the needs of someone else before yourself um, gives you a context. Because let's say you're a politician, and your goal is to get elected. If you operate in selfless love, you are now thinking about your constituents above your own desires. If you're um, a corporate CEO, you're now thinking about the needs of your workers, if you're a, a philanthropist or a Wall Street person and your stocks, 
you're now thinking about what are the needs of the clients or the people I represent or the people who work in those companies. It changes. It gives you a different paradigm. And I think it's it more clearly enunciates what the specifics of the kind of love that that needed. And uh, I actually speculate in uh, my book, the first book in the Vice Theory, but also in the movie, that that selfless love slightly accelerates you in time. And um, uh, the biblical con- the biblical parallel to that is operating in with discernment. Hmm. That when you are functioning outside of your own selfish desires and you're seeking the needs of others. The Holy Spirit gives you wisdom and insight and discernment that you would not have. And so I speculate also that we live in a time delay, that just like uh, um, a digital video recorder in a surveillance system, there is a time delay so that I can accommodate the two or three seconds before the motion happens. And I think this world is in a delay. And so... When you see someone who's a terrorist, by the time he pushes the button on the bomb, it's too late. That person needed to be reached before that. And we need to operate ahead of the time space curve to really make the changes in the world around us. And in the movie, I I set up something called the suicide bomber scene, where actually one of the members of the Vitruvian Code Project, we call it, is able to connect to this young man by having discernment before he pulls, pushes the trigger Interesting. on the explosive device. When do you think that movie will be available? Oh, I'm just guessing. I imagine it's probably two to three years. Oh, gotcha. uh, but you probably. say the script is fully written? The book is written. Gotcha. A screenwriter then takes it and puts in things like camera angles right. and other information that needs to be added. Uh characters the way that they stand even my all of that stuff has to be developed but do, i have that do have you have that, a book that's available for people to read um both of these have not been published yet um i, I think i mentioned about the producer from the radio show right, yeah, saying yeah, yeah, yeah. you need to get your audio book out he says right. I, I from what i from what i heard i i think this was the first year um that audiobooks surpassed printed books that's in, yeah, I do believe that they're taking over. I had a guest who said that his Audible book sold more more than his printed book. So he had right. more readers or more listeners. And so that's going to be my first emphasis. I have something, somebody working right now on that to try to get that to come to pass. And I'm thinking that's going to be probably somewhere in the next month or so. Gotcha. Oh, good. Um, we are at the 47 minute, actually 48 minute mark. So maybe it's time if you, if I didn't ask the, any questions or if there's something you would like to cover or uh, want to provide a summation, that, go ahead and do it, please. Yeah, I, I, my main thing is uh, I think what I'm going to do is in my YouTube broadcast, uh, rather than trying to put a lot of production value into it because I don't have that yet, is to take other people's videos because I've been watching YouTube a lot and so I'll watch all the latest theories so the super string theory or there's something called the E8 dimensional structures theory you probably heard of that yeah. um, there's a lot of these theories out and what I want to do is just take them and not not bash them but show that the errors of the of the thinking in a way so that it gives credibility uh, so, for example, in the Big Bang Theory, uh, one of the things it talks about is they can't accommodate for the equal, appears to be equal he- heating of deep space. You've heard about that, like three degrees above the absolute zero. Mm-hmm. Also, they can't accommodate for what they call the microwave background radiation. Well, in this theory, it, it, it fills all the dots. It fills all the gaps because it says, look, all that noise, all that static, all that that you hear is evidence of the virus active in everything it's out there also this matches uh the appearance of the universe at this time because everything is not symmetrical but it was designed to be so and so you're going to find consistency if that makes sense i think so yeah you're going to find consistency 
makes sense when you had a, initially a symmetrical based program for the virus to just affect it in different pockets in different ways. And that's what would explain the even heating, if that makes sense, the appearance. But when you go to certain areas, the, the heat temperature is not consistent. So you can find inconsistencies, but you overall find some level of consistency that then violates if you're trying to create a theory made up only in consistencies. Does that make sense? I think so. And where is your YouTube channel if people want to watch your um, the lecture that I watched? Uh, the way that I tell people is to just, I was a guest lecture, I uh, did a guest lecture at University of New Mexico. So if they just go to UNM lecture and put in the word vice, UNM lecture vice, they'll see the Vitruvian Code Project channel. Gotcha. And I think it's really just Vitruvian Code Project. I think that the those, just spell it out. And yeah, go Vitruvian is spelled V, it's V-I-R-T-U- R U V I A N, right? Vitruvian? Um, no, Vitruvian is like V I T R U V I, kind of like virtue. Yeah, virtue. let me let me uh, let me look it up because in English it doesn't carry the R with it. Vitruvian, V I T R U V I A N, I think is it. Yeah, Vitruvian. So Vitruvian Code Project, or, or just type U N M Lecture Vice, and they'll gotcha. see that. And do you and have any other social media? Are you on Facebook or Twitter or anything like that? Uh, yeah, I'm on Facebook. Uh, so same thing, Vitruvian Code Project. Um, if you just type Facebook.com and Vitruvian Code Project, you'll get that page. I'm also on SoundCloud. Oh, nice. Uh, and th that's something they can actually get to now. It's an audio, but it's using text-to-speech. Gotcha. So it isn't, It isn't. Uh, and for example, Amazon won't let you sell an audio book using text-to-speech. It has to be a real person. Gotcha. So th that's the dilemma in using that. But you will find the Vice Theory and the Vitruvian Code Project on uh, audio on SoundCloud. Gotcha. You just go, if you just put in Vice Theory or Vitruvian Code Project, you'll find it. And you can, I think you can download SoundCloud. I don't know. I, I don't. I think I, you're right. I'm, um, but those are what I'm using. I do have Twitter, but I hardly ever use it. Um, all those other things, I'm going to have to get some young, smart guy person to handle all of that. Uh, my my main concern right now is I interact with the latest of, of current theories, and uh, and and try to come up with a way to respond to them. That's what I spend most of my time right now. Gotcha. So if there's well, something you see, the latest thing, hey, just bounce it off me, and uh, I'll give you at least a, I'll I'll offer an explanation. Sounds good, Howard De La Cruz Bancroft. Thank you so much for being on the show. Appreciate it. Thanks, William.